Welcome back to The Glenn Alex Show. I'm your host, Glenn Alex. Each episode of The Glenn Alex Show focuses on a different aspect of health because I believe in total health. And I am on a mission to help as many people as I can be joyful, connected, confident, and complete. The life experience I call wealth, W-E-L-L-T-H, which is health plus other riches. Now, just think about that for a moment. If more of us were in pursuit of living in total health or even living in total health, the world would be safe and loving for everyone. So I hope you join us on this journey and enjoy this episode that I'm um, pretty interested in because I am definitely going to learn something new about health and well-being. Please help me welcome my guest, Dr. Greg Elliott, an osteopath. Hi, Greg. Hi, how are you doing? I am doing well. How are you? Fantastic. It's early in the week. It's, uh, it was a holiday here in in, uh, in uh, our province on, on Monday, so it's kind of like the start of my week, so I got a lot of energy. Oh. I'm excited to dive in. Okay. What was the holiday? It's Truth and Reconciliation Day. So uh, it's uh, with our Indigenous populations. Uh, there was a lot of... Um, uncoverings of past discretions that, that has happened with our with our government uh, in regards to okay. the um, uh, schools that they were they were provided with and, and so uh, with that as a day reflection um, with uh, with a lot of our indigenous culture uh, around you know, positivity and, and growth going forward okay very nice very nice well I hope you had a great holiday weekend yeah it was great Awesome. Awesome. Well let's definitely dive in uh, <laughs> so take a moment and just um, tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah, my name is Greg Elliott. I'm an, I'm an osteopath up here in, in, in Vancouver, also exercise physiologist. And, and uh, so I'm in the um, the clinic a couple of days a week, um, primarily focusing on what I like to call the invisible illnesses, people that suffer from chronic pain syndromes like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, depression, PTSD, anxiety. So a lot of the, the typical illnesses and diseases that the medical system don't have a great reputation of, of solving. Um, and it really takes an integrative approach. And that's the kind of approach that I've taken. I've surrounded myself with a, a phenomenal clinical team of, of different practitioners from different areas. And we focus on, as you talk about in, in everything that, that uh, this uh, podcast is about, is about whole health, the person, the individual themselves, and, and try not to have a siloed approach where it's specifically one type of modality being done and we sit down as a team and we discuss um you know our, our more complex cases to, to really you know making sure that we're dealing with all areas of okay. health and well-being and, and not just you know in our specific domain in our area okay excellent excellent now what led you to this work that's a that's a really good question so i've always had an interest in health i grew up as, as an athlete um focusing on you know, high performance for long periods of time. And, and so that was my area of expertise, but uh, with a few, um, I'd say physical ailments of, of my family and, and seeing some of the decline and what's going uh, with them, um, I was very intrigued of, of how can we improve health and well-being, but really, right? Not just, you know, through, we saw the failures of of the the medications that we thought were, were revolutionary and, and uh, you know, just still people just, they're, they're staying alive and not necessarily living life. Right. And so that's, that's not what I wanted. And I, I got obsessed with the modalities that can, you know, sustain and maintain a healthy living. And so exercise is one of those areas that I thought was, was a phenomenal way. So I, I did my master's degree in exercise physiology and 
And as you do, when you graduate from school, you, you leave there thinking that I have all the tools to, to solve the world's problems um, <laughs> with that. And as I started to get into practice, I realized that I had a very small skill set uh, yes. into that. And so uh, I started my uh, osteopath training in, in Vancouver in, in 2015, graduated in 2021 um, uh, from there. And, and that gave me a lot more kind of tools and modalities to be able to kind of help. And, and along the way, learning the complexity of health and well-being and what is actually comprised in those specific areas and, and talking to people. And one of the things that kind of led me down this, this path of looking at this whole person is, you know, like I said, I, I had exercise as my primary modality, but you know, how are physical therapists getting people better? How are psychologists and clinical right. counselors? How do medical, medical doctors, those people are getting people, health coaches, um, you know, uh, group classes. And, and so, you know, these all provide benefit, right. But they don't fall within my, how are these people, what are they tapping into that I'm not? And so I got very curious of surrounding myself with individuals that have the same goal, which is, you know, living long, healthy lives, but not maybe the same, you know, background as, or, or values that I have that I think that are is most important more than others. And, and having that and being challenged of truly looking at the, the biopsychosocial health of an individual, um, you know, well, and, and each, you know, weighting each of those as, itself comparatively to others not one's more important than the other but as a, as a whole person and, and and be able to figure out how can we best help uh those people right and it, it definitely takes an open mind to uh, make itself available to learning new information and not just um seek what you already know and confirm that so no, completely they, right yeah and, and yeah to realize Again, you know, the one example that I, I typically bring up is, is we think of, of mental illness and in, in typically in, in the, the, the one side of it. And from my side, it's like that very, you know, biological sense, right? It's biochemistry in yes. regards to the neuro, but don't realize that our environment, our being, our past experiences are going to impact our biochemistry just as much as what we can do from the other way around. It's bi-directional or typically omnidirectional in regards to this specific condition. And so you can't look at it the one direction. I have right. the way that my mind works is that one direction, but I want to be challenged of like, is that the right decision for this individual right, right now? Is that the approach that we need to be able to go? Or are there alternative ways that we should start with first based on that person that's in front of me? Right, right. Well, I, I totally appreciate the whole person approach and uh, dealing with patients as individuals. So thank you. Now, I want to learn about heart rate variability. So please tell us what that is. <laughs> yeah, this is, it's starting to become more mainstream now. When I first started, uh, even medical doctors and, and other practitioners, cardiologists were looking at me like I'm, you know, speaking some sort of weird uh, thing that I was kind of bringing out of thin air, but it's become more from a medical standpoint, from a, from a health practitioner standpoint, it's become pretty, you know, more understood and, and more widely accepted. And, it, and it's now starting to cross over to the general consumer. Okay. So um, my, in my master's degree in, in exercise physiology, my thesis was on non-invasive ways of measuring heart function. So we're trying to find, figure out ways to, in the clinical populations, measure the function of the heart non-invasively without having to do catheters or, you know, you know all the type of stuff. What are, what are ways? I got introduced to heart rate variability at the time. And um, that's when I got first introduced to and was curious about it all. And, and I didn't include it in my thesis because it had to do with exercise as a part of it. And um, But when I got back home, I started to, to look at it a little bit more. And, and I always start off with saying, you know, it's different than heart rate. I think we're very familiar with heart rate. You know, 60 beats per minute, 90 beats per minute, all those type of things. But what's actually significantly more important to our health and longevity is the frequency of which those beats occur. Okay. Right. So Glenn, you and I can have 60 beats per minute as our resting heart rate, right? Whether through the nighttime or when we wake up, we're at rest, we're relaxing, we, we can have 60 beats per minute identical. But my heart rate beats like a metronome, super consistent, right? On the second, every single second. But yours varies. It goes up and it speeds up and it slows down, right? In this nice kind of rhythmic pattern. Okay. What research shows is that you are in a healthier, happier state than I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very counterintuitive to what most people think, because we think of What's health? Health is homeostasis. We have these very, you know, narrow windows that our blood sugar needs to be regulated, our blood pressure needs to be here, or everything needs to be super consistent in regards to what's going on. But that's kind of, that's not the way that heart rate variability works. 
more variability is, is a person has is, is a healthier they're they're mentally more uh they have more emotional control they're more connected with other people they have the ability to be able to do so and so through a wide range of whole health biomarkers right or markers in general heart rate variability should be higher uh than the than uh than lower okay so uh, make sure i understand heart rate variability is the time in between heartbeats Exactly. Yep. So it, it measures each heartbeat from one beat to the next. Okay. Right? Now, what heart rate is, is, well, how many beats, how many beats actually occur within that minute? Okay. Right. And you and I can have very similar, but the rate at which those beats occur is, is, is what heart rate variability measures. And so as we, as we're relaxing, you want to see, actually see your heart rate speed up and slow down. So you would have more variable times in between each beat than consistent. I don't want to see a heart rate that beats on the second every second okay. or very consistently from time to time. Now that's at rest, right? So we're, when we're relaxing, we're recovering. That's what we want to be able to see is we want to have more variability in our resting heart rate. Interesting. Interesting. So did you develop a way to the way to measure it? No. So this was the, it was first kind of research. I mean, you, you know, truly as it is today is, is about in the fifties and a lot of the space programs were starting to be able to use this. It's used a lot in um, neonatal and, and um, in, uh, in early, you know, uh, in pregnancy for a lot of individuals to look at the, the health of the baby. So there, there's pulmonary studies that were done in, in specific areas. And okay. so uh, this was typically done by an ECG, which, you know, for heart rhythms mm-hmm. to look at how your heart's doing and and all that. And, and so uh, that was for the longest time, the gold standard. And so it wasn't necessarily applied to the general consumer for long periods of time because you needed very accurate results. Okay. Very specific because it has to do with milliseconds uh, of, 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 uh, of, you know, of, of a heart rate. So you have to be very, very uh, accurate in regards to going on. A couple beats off, and the measurements is completely uh, wonky. So um, you know, when, when wearables first started to come out, you know, like Fitbits and Apple Watches and things like that, it was tough for them to even get heart rate. Okay. And so if you can't get heart rate right, can't you're not going to get heart rate variability right. Okay. And so the only way to measure for a long period of time was in a laboratory setting with very expensive equipment. Now, with the advancements of these wearable technologies uh, uh, that are on there with different, you know, different light frequencies and all that, we can actually get pretty darn accurate measures okay. of people's heart rate variability through uh, looking at some of this this information. Um, and so, um, the 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 measurements were all there. It just took a lot of technological advances. But for the last decade, I've been using heart rate variability information with my with my patients and clients uh, to as, use as a, as a as a primary biomarker. And and now it's a $99 Fitbit, you can get, okay. uh, you can get heart rate variability measurements that are pretty darn accurate. Interesting. Interesting. So what is the difference between heart rate variability, which is the time in between heartbeats and arrhythmia? Great question. They're very similar in that standpoint, right? So you can have high heart rate variability and have an arrhythmia, right? So, you know, atrial fibrillation, people will have very high the heart rate variability. If you have a lot of PVCs, premature ventricular, ventricular contractions, you can get some high heart rate variabilities. And, and when I consult with people, sometimes you see these astronomically high numbers, right? That are just like off the charts. Like you're you're two times an Olympic level athlete in regards to the amount of variability you have, which is, you know, and the number one thing I say to people is, is make sure just double check that there's not some sort of arrhythmia, right? Okay. So heart rate variability means more variability in sinus rhythm. So we have a normal heart rhythm. There's no abnormalities, no arrhythmias, there's nothing like that that are what's going on. Uh, so this information is provided in the absence of arrhythmia. So one of the, the the things in regards to a lot of studies is making sure that you have none of these. Uh, you have sinus rhythm, you are in sinus rhythm when you do these metrics. And the softwares are getting pretty good at picking those abnormal beats out. Okay. This is a natural phenomenon that happens within the body. Um, independent of, of arrhythmias. So this is, these are all normal occurring beats. Okay. Yeah. So an arrhythmia is an abnormal beat. Arrhythmia would, would be some sort of abnormal beat where it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, and the atria, the top of the heart contracts faster or the, the bottom where okay. you get this abnormal uh, thing where it's, it's a, it's not a, we call normal sinus rhythm or NSR. Okay. It's not an NSR beat. Uh, it is uh, an abnormal beat. So this is uh, heart rate variability is a measurement of all your normal uh, arrhythmic uh, rhythmic beats. 
uh, in the absence of, of all of those arrhythmias, if necessary. Okay, interesting, interesting. Now, it sounds like um, that heart rate variability can be used as a measure of the whole person. Absolutely. Yeah, so so how that is and how we make this connection between it all is, is okay, well, you know, we want more variability uh, in our heart rate at rest, right? So well, what is this actually a measure of? Like, what is this actually really measuring in our body that makes it meaningful? This is a measurement of our autonomic nervous system. It measures, okay. it, it measures the amount of, of uh, parasympathetic or in our rest and digest system that's being okay. active. Okay. Our vagus nerve is the most active uh, uh, parasympathetic nerve and our body controls the most amount of, of rest and digest functions through the entire body. Mm. And that's more, uh, uh, more uh, innervation of that nerve. So that nerve being more active increases the amount of variability we have in our heart rate. Okay. Right. When we're stressed, our body's in a stress state. It removes that vagal tone, removes that, that uh, uh, innervation uh, and the amount of innervation that's going to the heart goes to the sympathetic system to go fight what's going on. And then our heart rate becomes more metronome like. Okay. So it's a measure of how much our body is under physical, emotional, social, spiritual stress. Okay. Okay. So I'm in traffic yeah. <laughs> and I'm angry about it though. It's the same route every day. Yeah. <laughs> That's just the city I live in. Right that's going to affect my heart rate variability at the same time. It's going to probably trigger some um, anxiety and some outbursts and some unhealthy eating habits, yeah. right? I'm going to emotionally eat to calm myself down. Same, uh, a different scenario of stress is maybe uh, graduating from college. It's a very, um, it's a, it's you stress. It's a positive event, yet it's still stress. Now, would that have the same effect on HRV as the traffic? That That is a phenomenal question. And this is one that's, it's a little more nuanced, but I'll be able to kind of like give a, a high level overview of this. Okay. Right? And so my quote that I always say in presentations is that Dr. Hans Selye, who came up with the word stress and shout out to Canadian endocrinologist, <laughs> but he came up with the word stress. And he says that it's not stress that kills us. It's our reaction to it. So that, depending on how bad that traffic is, it's our reaction to that. Uh, it, and it, it could be to the point that someone cuts you off, you get very upset, and that stays with you for the rest of the day. Yes. Right? Where the graduation, great, happy, awesome, elated. But in regards to that response, right, it's intense in the moment, but we, we recover and be able to get more of a, a normal type of, of a stress level on a very quick uh, basis, right? Okay. And that's that point where something else can be, you know, significantly more impactful for our mind and what we're going on and say, oh, because of traffic and now I'm late and now I'm behind all day. And then that's your excuse the entire day of what's going on and that, and then not to home in this. And then, so it, it, you become, you ruminate about it all. You magnify the problem in all yes. those different areas. And so it's not necessarily like one of the sayings in exercise physiology, it's it kind of and it translates over to what's going on. They regards to our, our kind of overall stress management. It, they say it's like you can never overtrain. You can just under recover. Okay. Okay. So meaning the fact that we can train as much as we want, but if we don't all allocate time to be able to recover from that stress and relax, regenerate to be able to go, if we don't have adequate time into there, we'll be in a continuous state of overtraining and stress, and it's just going to okay. pile on as you go forward. Stress is, is a positive thing, as, as we know, like we need stress in our lives, but it's about making sure that we don't let it control. It's not majority of what's going on uh, to that standpoint. Now, as we know, there's so many more forms of stress that are out there for us before way more simple. And, I, and I'm, I'm sure we, we, this has been talked about for, for a lot of different people is before it was mainly food, making sure you, you survive. It, yeah. It's fight or flight. It's about survival at that point, right? A lot less threats than we do have now, where we have, um, you know, world impact news that 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 affects us. Our, our everything that's going on with with politics, you know, we have these, you know, social media influencers that are showing that their lives are so great. Well, why can't we be there? And and about these material things that we be able to provide and and traffic, 
and uh, <laughs> the, the foods that are are more satiating for us on an immediate basis, but and what we need, but you know, where we have an over some overabundance of, of, of food and all these things. So we have more avenues to accumulate more of this stress, which is the problem is that we we don't remove ourselves from it, right? People wake up, right. they read emails. Oh my God, do this today, do that. Got to get kids ready. Got to do this. Now got to drive in traffic. As I go home and sit in the middle of the night and start to look at all these people having so much, so many great times on the vacation or how they're living the life that I want to be able to live. And then I have to go to sleep and try to recover during all that. It's like, there's no time to recover from anything because we're bombarded by the stimuli and all these stresses on a continuous basis is that yes, we are overstressed because we don't have the time to shut down and relax and recover and regenerate. Right. We're all definitely overstimulated. Definitely. Now, in addition to um, how we respond to stress, what are some, some things or activities that negatively impact HRV? Yeah, negatively. So the, the obvious ones are, are there. So uh, the one that's a big shocker for most individuals is alcohol. And I think we all know alcohol can impact our health and well-being, but I don't think people really know how much it actually impacts that. I had a, I had a patient that was using alcohol as a coping mechanism for her pain. Okay. And, you know, knew it wasn't good, but, but it helps me deal with it, right? As we got her on the wearable, so to see the heart rate variability, she goes, I knew alcohol was bad. I didn't know how bad it actually was, right? And it is now almost a year <laughs> that she's now not had a sip of alcohol. Okay. Right? It's that feedback mechanism to that uh, for her to understand. Alcohol is a gigantic one that has a significant negative impact. Okay. Other is going to be high amounts of um, um, like life stress, right? From day to day, right? If you're going through... Um, you know, a, a big day with a lot of things going on. I have a lot of big meetings. I, uh, you know, have a fight with my spouse, my partner, kids aren't behaving, you know, eat late, all that type of stuff, all can have negative impacts uh, into that. And, but even like acutely, you can look at exercise. Exercise has a negatively acute, um, uh, negative impact, a negative acute impact in regards to heart rate variability. Because if I train really hard and go and exercise a lot of law, my body's in that recovery state. And so it's it's stressed. And I, I gave it a, a simple amount of stress to what's going on. The big key is is to that is, is obviously what's the what's the rebound from that? That's the biggest thing. Is there, is it a positive or negative rebound uh when it comes to that specific intervention? You know, life stress can be can be very beneficial, but if you don't control it regularly and you don't manage it in an appropriate way it becomes too much of a, of a stress. I use this example, exercise is good. Too much exercise is not good, right? Because if you think about it this way, exercise, the reason why it's relatively simple, it's 30 minutes to maximum an hour a day of something, right? right. In and out, boom, boom, boom. I don't have to deal with it any other time other than that, right? So it's a very easy stress to be able to manage. When you start to be able to deal with financial stress or work stress or family stress or any of these type of things, it is a 24 hour, Typically, brain continues to work. It is a consistent stress into what's going on. Imagine you having to be on a bike for 18 hours a day. Hmm, wouldn't happen. <laughs> right? Your body, you would give up. Like you would see, like your body's too stressed. I can't yes. do it anymore. Like that, you get the fatigue, you get this. Like it's a yes. lot of the same symptomology of, of okay. what's going on. And it's because it's like, you can't imagine doing that for 18 hours, but you ruminating about some sort of problem or magnifying it or you know, having, you know, self-doubt in, into what's going on, like you, you decrease the amount of agency or gratitude you have, it's just going to continuously eat at you on, on, a, on a continuous basis and deplete your resources, deplete your energy, and you won't be able to have that recovery state that you need. You can't disconnect from it. And so okay. that's, so the big things is, is uh, to sum up, alcohol is a big one. Okay. Exercise will have a, a negative impact. Um, um, you know, high inflammatory foods is another uh, and, and a high stressful environment is, is the fourth. Okay. Okay. Now, can you predict what types of ailments someone will have with a low HRV? That's a, that's another great question. So the right now you can't necessarily predict. There are there are things that we're getting closer to understand. That you can get better understanding on based on heart rate variability. I know I've seen it over, over the last ten years of 
of looking at heart rate variability and uh, heart disease uh, in regards to, to, to what's going on, do people have heart disease versus not? And so there's some preliminary uh, understanding of, of that. I don't think it's great yet, but okay. we're getting there. Um, there's fitness levels. Uh, people that typically have high or uh, heart rate variability will have higher fitness levels, especially when we can get to a, to a specific uh, category. And, and, and again, arrhythmias aren't, aren't there, which is predominant in, in the, the aerobic uh, athletes. Um, there's also emotional states. Uh, which is interesting in the moment. Uh, there's there's a couple of companies out there looking at getting real time HRV data and looking to the point of can I determine based on what you said the intensity of emotion, but also the valence of emotion. Can I okay. can I determine are they agitated versus are they content or are they calm? And so there's information that can be done out there. But in regards to saying you look at a specific number and be like, oh, this person has diabetes. Uh, no, we won't be able to do that. It's not diagnostic. Okay. Um, but to me, and this is what, what the beauty about HRV is to me that it's, it is, it is a whole health biomarker. Okay. The problem is I can't differentiate between cardiovascular disease and depression in regards to specific numbers. Okay. Not even if say, uh, someone's predisposed, uh, predisposed to diabetes and they have a low HRV. Yeah. So it would increase the risk. Okay. You know, you start to look at people that have diabetes. Absolutely. Um, you know, you, they have lower heart rate variability based on many mechanisms and crossovers as to, to why that may be. But people that are type 2 diabetic um, uh, definitely have lower heart rate variabilities. But I can't tell that diabetic to, to a degree that you're more predisposed to cardiovascular disease versus okay. a depressive episode. And we'll, okay. we'll be able to make those determining factors. Um, but what we do know is, is the fact that if you know, if we look at, if we can control health, right. And we have these one factors. So say individuals, individuals that we, that we research have very similar, uh, 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 emotional health, social health, spiritual health, but have some sort of physical ailment, whether it's, whether it's diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancers, those people will have lower heart rate variability okay. in the controls. Okay. Okay. So what range are we talking about? What's low Great versus question. high? That's another one. And this is another one that always people always ask, like, we know what is high and what is low. And it gets a little complicated because in the past, the statistics that are out there, it's if they weren't as agreed upon as, say, heart rate, right? Okay. So, you know, beats per minute is the, the gold standard. When it comes to heart rate variability, there's so many metrics out there that people are are posting uh, uh, and have, have published in regards to the research articles. They look at frequency domain, which is, you know, you start to look at the, the amount of frequency of, of, a, of a heart rhythm. Okay. Uh, and high frequency, low frequency. There's nonlinear statistics. There's standard deviations. There's uh, uh, um, uh, numerical ones and imperial ones. And so there's there's all over the places a bunch of different statistics. Now, the one that majority of wearable technology, because again, the whole thing is how do we translate into this into the regular person, regular mm -hmm. human being? Mm -hmm. Majority of the the wearable products that are out there, their specific measurement. Is called the root mean square of successive differences. So, <laughs> okay, I know easy for you to say. <laughs> exactly, because I've said it a thousand times. I could relatively say it uh, confidently now. Uh, don't worry about the math about it all. But what it looks at, uh, again, it, it's it, it's it just looks at the differences. It's a way to measure heart rate variability. Um, and so RMSSD is for short. So when you look at any literature, you look at it in the app. They will say heart rate variability, and they would more than likely say RMSSD, and so that's the the number okay. I'm going with. Of. Okay. So when you look at level uh, Olympic level athletes, people that are the you know seem to be the picture uh, of health, they have great diets, they're very regimented. Uh, you know, they always try to recover that type of stuff. You're looking at in the numbers anywhere from about eighty to a hundred. It seems to be like a higher value. Okay. Right? Okay. It's not uncommon to see people just over a hundred uh, into that standpoint, but that gives you an idea uh, of as to where people are. People that have cardiovascular disease, uh, uh, a little bit older, you, you see them have in the ranges of about 30 to 20. Okay. Right. And that's directly because it's directly impacting the heart. That's, you know, and, and you start to see those, like, you, you see those kind of lower ranges in that side of things. Okay. So a very high value seems to be about 100. A very low value seems to be in, in the 20s. Okay. But it's not abnormal to see lower than that. Uh, I have a colleague that um, she's in her ninth, uh, last trimester of pregnancy ninth, uh, and her numbers are like 11 and 12. Oh, wow. Right. And so it's not uncommon. Everything's health gets checked out, you know, all the time. Everything seems to be healthy in that standpoint, but just again, a lot of stress for her to go under. Okay. Okay. So you mentioned um, smart devices, apps. So do all of the health apps that are native to the smartphones 
Uh, do they have the ability to measure HRV? So the, there's a couple ways to be able to get uh, HRV. So one is through wearable devices like an Apple Watch, which does have the capabilities. Okay. It's not great, um, but it does have the capabilities. Uh, I think all the activity trackers now, like the Fitbits, like the, the Garmin watches, um, a lot of those have uh, the, the the ability to capture this information uh, from there. And then you have the higher fidelity ones, which you talk about. There's a, a company called Whoop, which have a they have a Whoop band. Uh, there's a company called uh, Aura Ring, which is a ring based wearable. These have no display, so these aren't smart watches. Okay. They're literally just a band to calculate information, and that's what they're designed to be able to do. Um, which then pairs to your to your phone. So that's one way to do it. The other way is that uh, there's apps out there. Um, the, the guy that I that I know uh, of the last few years, his name is Marco Altini. He has a he's an app. It's called HRV for training, geared towards athletes. But it uses the camera phone on your phone to measure heart rate variability. So people wake up, they open the app, you put your finger on there with the light, it gets the PPG sense from there. He is a data scientist, PhD, so he's done his due diligence in regards to the accuracy of this. Uh, but it could be as simple as that. I think it's like, I think it's $10 uh, for, for an app for, for that oh, wow. standpoint. Okay. And you can get uh, wearables as cheap as like, you know, 90 bucks, $99 uh, from Fitbit that actually calculate this information. Okay. So how often would you recommend the layperson measures their HRV? I had this question on another podcast of standpoint of saying like, you know, this isn't something like, you know, you know, how long should you measure me and that type of stuff. And, and to me, it's like, I, I want people to be aware of this, this number. So when I work with people, you know, get them started on it, or people have worn for, for a long period of time, it's usually where you want to be able to, to, to look at something in your health to be able to change. Okay. Right. So, Hey, I want to be able to, to do a, typically I say a baseline or understand your day-to-day -day variation is about anywhere from five to 10 days. Okay. So you do it from five to 10 days, and then you start to be able to enact a sort of behavior change, whether it's change in exercise, diet, meditation, you're going somewhere, you're doing something, you're, you're going to classes, whatever necessary, maybe you're trying to alter your health in some way. Okay. You start to measure what those changes are. But what's super important as we, as we do now is we can't let this run our lives. And I see this often, <laughs> way too often, where people are so obsessed with the numbers they've been tracking for so long, period, like a period of time that any little change they're like, Oh my gosh, like what happened with my sleep? Why didn't I have a lot of REM sleep? Right. Why didn't okay. I? And they're so ingrained into that standpoint. And to me, it's like, no, no, no. Like, you know, things are going to fluctuate and they go up and down based on many different life changes. And, but the goal is that if you want to be able to alter something or change something, just making sure that it's the right thing. If you take a supplement, right. It's, it's money. If you take time out of your day to have to go run, I mean, this, these are things that you could be, you know, doing best allocated to other things, whether spending time with family or whatever, these are, these are investments that you're doing into your health. I want to make sure that that investment is worth it. Okay. And so HRV is my feedback of saying that investment is worth it. That dietary change from being vegan to eating meat is now beneficial for you to, or vice versa. Uh, you know, doing more aerobic exercise versus strength training is actually more beneficial for you for what your goals are. Okay. And we can see that through your heart rate variability or changes to sleep pattern, whatever necessarily may be. It's worth you having that behavior change. And once you know that and things are kind of good, you don't have to monitor it until, you know, maybe months down the road. I want to see where you're at compared to where you were. And, and, uh, and see, I, I, I've i been measuring my HRV for a decade now, and uh, I haven't even checked it. You know, I have a wearable device, the Aura Ring, which I wear, measures it passively through the nighttime. Um, I haven't checked it today. Okay. I, I, I don't know what it is because uh, okay. to me, it's like I'm doing everything right, but it's just me tracking it there. And if I want to change something, I see what where I've been, where I want to be able to go. And I have zero obsession uh, around this this data because I know everything I'm doing is pretty darn, pretty darn good. So I'd say start with it, see, make some changes. Hey, you're living life the way that you should be. Great. You know what it is. Then you're good to go. Okay. Okay. Now, this may um, be intuitive. Yet sometimes people need to hear it. What specifically can we do to um, uh, increase the activity of the vagus nerve to, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, to activate that relaxation response? That's a great one. Um... And uh, every, every time someone asks me this question, I, I bring a story up. I was in um, New York do, doing a, a presentation and uh, there was a keynote speaker of a famous 
longevity doctor that's there. I won't necessarily name names, but uh, he was going through his presentation about all things longevity, health span, and trying to be healthy. And by number 193, I was like, okay, <laughs> there's too many things, <laughs> right? I'm like, I get all these things are beneficial, but I'm like, my, I'm overwhelmed by like, you know, who has the time to be able to do these things? Like, I, this is not practical information. And luckily, the first question, the person goes up there and, and the person goes, I love what you're saying. Absolutely. I deal with people. People don't have time to do all these things. What are the five things that you would do to improve the health span and longevity of an individual? And it fits in right with specifically of how do we increase uh, our, our vagus nerve uh, from there. So um, the five major things that I'd say for us to get into that parasympathetic state, that rest and digest, get everything you know, uh, which in turn is going to make us uh, live longer and healthier lives is one is, is it going to be physical activity. Now in particular, this is that low intensity type of activity. So this would be what they call a uh, very popular now, which everyone knows is, is the zone two zone two training. Zone two training is, is essentially if you and I were having this podcast and you can kind of say, Hey, you know, and the video weren't here and my speech wasn't perfect. I was kind of, you know, have a little bit of break in between, but it wasn't laboring me to talk. Mm -hmm. That's zone two. I okay. call it a talk test. So it's like, you can't have a normal conversation like this, but I'm not having to be like, hold on, let me, let me do this exercise. And so it's that kind of, okay. you know, low intensity. And you're looking at about 180 minutes a week, right? Okay. So anywhere from the two to three hours. So that's one. Okay. Two is going to be from a, from a dietary perspective, have a low inflammatory diet. Now that's a very generalized statement to what's going on. I, I right. And, and because I think dietary is, is so nuanced in regards to what is inflammatory for individuals, right. Yeah, exactly. Based on palates and all <laughs> over the place, right. Into that standpoint. Um, but all I can say is to the point of, I've, I mean, from a general sense, as long as you're relatively trying to eat the food that, that it, the way that it's made, you know, 80% of your diet is trying to be from, you know, fruits and vegetables and, you know, things that are not processed, to, you know, uh, uh, a thousand times or also ultra, ultra processed foods and you're hydrating appropriately, that's a phenomenal start. Okay. Right? But okay. if you want to dive that rabbit hole, it's, it's uh, very, very deep uh, of a rabbit hole, but uh, you know, generalized standpoint, you're making conscious effort around your nutrition, making sure you're having uh, a close natural. So, so that's number two. Number three is, is optimizing your circadian rhythm. So again, another big generalized statement, all that is, is from a sleep perspective, is that you're trying to go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time okay. from a sleep and recovery standpoint. That's the best. You set the time you want to go to bed. You set the time you want to wake up and you keep that consistent. Okay. It may take months to be able to get there, but that right. is a, that is one of the most fundamental things that we can do to making sure that our body's in that natural cycle of our circadian rhythm, which is super important of resetting. Yes. There's other things we can possibly do, but to me, that's the most fundamental one from there. Okay. Number four is going to be uh, uh, is, is stress management, mm -hmm. right? And, and uh, dealing with our day to day again, another very generalized thing of like, oh, deal with stress, right? Because how you and I Glenn, will deal with stress is very different. You and I can yeah. can have a, a work problem that, that arises where you know um, I completely lose it, my emotions are all out of whack, right? where you just isolate yourself from individuals, be able to sit down and, and be able to kind of do the work. Now, obviously, depending on time, I mean, those are coping mechanisms in the moment to be able to deal with it, but maybe long-term be detrimental, but those reactions to a stressful uh, situation is very individual. Okay. So understanding how we react to very stressful situations and be able to mitigate that is, is super important. It takes a lot of self-discovery. This is a, this is a way deeper one um, that, that needs to be, um, squeezed out a little bit more and dived into significantly to figure out those emo those responses to, to our, our stressful environment and how do we mitigate those. Last is going to be connection with people, mm -hmm. right? And so I, you know, I, I, I like to say that, that COVID to me was a gigantic social experiment to, sh to show how much social interactions are important to our health and well-being, right? Because mm -hmm. we had the physical, we know the, I mean, forever it's been, you know, activity, uh, nutrition and sleep are the big pillar of, of health, like focus on those things. Right. And then we had, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the whole mental health side of things coming out right. of how mental health, you know, still relatively not accepted into what's going on. But I think the, the conversations and understandings of how important those are to our, our health and well being and longevity, um, and how really important it actually is. And then to me, it's like, you know, I think people underestimated the social connection of, of 
the value that that has in regards to health and well-being. And I had a patient to come in soon after, you know, we started to be able to see uh, uh, patients in person and started talking about a mysterious shoulder pain that came up out of nowhere that, that the last five years of working together wasn't there before. And talking it out with her and things like that, wasn't seeing anybody in a partner, had an older mom that she was really close with, but only can talk by, you know, Zoom and, you know, was, was working on a computer. And she goes like, I just don't remember the last time someone gave me a hug. Hmm. Right? Right. In the last three years, shoulder pain hasn't been around ever since. Yeah. And so you cut that social uh, uh, um, um, connection uh, with people, that personal, interpersonal connection that can sometimes only happen in person. And you remove that, you start to see the mental health and the physical health just, you know, for a lot of people dwindle. So say those are the five big pillars okay. um, into re- what we can do to tap into that vagus nerve, to get into the parasympathetic and really improve our health and longevity. Okay. Well, I, I work with adults who are experiencing anxiety and depression. And those are five things that we talk about all the time and how to individualize those tools to help themselves be um, mentally healthier, emotionally healthier, physically healthier, better in relationship, et cetera. So thank you. I like <laughs> I like that you said that so people can hear specifically what they can, the, the simple things that they can do to enhance their own health. Totally. And and the biggest thing is, and this is why I like HRV as a feedback, is, is people can see that impact of what, when they start to be able to create the positive behavior change and they can see it on a, on a consistent basis. So rather than writing something down or waiting six months to get blood work done. What are some feedback mechanisms that I can get to know that the fact that if I engage into mindfulness, if I engage into meditation or any type of, of, uh, of mental fitness type of techniques, or if I change my diet or do these things is I want, you know, to support the behavior change. It's good to get that feedback for the individual. Right. right. And so that's where I see that complementary is to the point of like, yes, Hey, we're working on these things. And sometimes as you know, especially with people that are dealing with those things and, and kind of I do the parallel of, you know, post-concussion syndrome people. Sometimes people can make unbelievable strides into something, but it's hard for them to see over the, the three months of how far they've come. Mm-hmm. The six months and year, it's like they have one setback. Oh, I'm back at the beginning. Yes. It's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. No, and no, this no. is where that objective feedback of HRV to say like, listen, you started at the 30. You're now at a 60, right? We were able to get more, capacity for you to be able to deal with stress, right? You may have a setback now, but you've done so much work and you've doubled your, your ability to be able to do so. So it's that feedback. And I kind of say, you've done a lot of work. Let's keep going rather than if it falls off and it's like, I'm just going to give up because I'm back to square one. It's like, no, 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 not square one. You're, you're well on your way to getting there. It's just, this is a bump in the road and let's continue on because we're making phenomenal progress. That's where I like this feedback mechanism for people and those types of conditions because it just, it reiterates that, hey, like we're on the right track. You're doing a lot of the work. It provides a lot of agency into their health. Okay. Okay. Wow. This has been really interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I do have a, um, if you can narrow all of what you said down to one nugget, what is the one takeaway you want the audience to have? I think to me is I, I really feel that what needs to be vocalized more is the fact that we have a significant amount of control over our health and well-being more than we think. I think a lot of it now has been taken away where with social media, it's like, oh, you can't eat this food or you can't eat that food mm-hmm. or don't eat this or don't eat that. Or you have all these kind of solutions uh, that are out there that people are thinking like, oh, I, I really don't know what's going on. I, I really have no control of what, uh, what that is. And I think the medical system is, is geared towards that. And so I think the the big message is people have a lot of agency, a lot of control over their health, more than they think mm-hmm. that they do. And there's a lot of impact that they can do themselves to making sure that, you know, they're, they're being the person that they want to be able to be. Okay. I like that. I like that a lot. Now, if, if someone has a question or wants to work with you, how can they get in touch? Yeah, uh, the advice of multiple people. I've I finally launched a personal website. So it's uh, <laughs> gregelliot.ca from there. Uh, I've done a lot of HRV kind of in, in health consultations for people. And, and it, mainly to me, it's just getting all the information laid down and kind of provide 
the right area that they want to be able to work in and, and help facilitate that a little bit more. So that's kind of okay. uh, um, that area. So I do some some um, personal consultations from from a, a whole health perspective. And the second is is um, uh, I founded a, a health tech startup. Um, and so what we do is we take uh, wearable technology. So if you have a Fitbit, you have a um, uh, Oura Ring or any type of wearables, you can pair it with our app. We ask a biopsychosocial assessment um, okay. for people, 10 different factors that we know can improve one HRV and two, improve your health and longevity. We ask these 10 factors and then we, we show you a, a standardized model that, that prioritizes which specific behaviors are more important. The difficult part is even I gave you five relatively, you know, straightforward things to be able to work on, but what's the more, most important one for you, right? Okay. Do I need to focus on more of my physical activity versus my nutrition? Do I need to work on my emotional regulation more than my sleep hygiene? Which area do I, of my health and well-being do I need to be able to focus on more? So if you do have a wearable product uh, that, that's out there, uh, we're adding more and more every day, but you can download our app and do the free assessment and be able to see from a biopsychosocial perspective, hey, let's 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 do a, a prioritized list of, of where you need to be able to, you know, if you're going to focus on one area, this is the area you'll, you'll focus in. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And all of that information is on your website, Greg Elliott. Yeah, absolutely. Dot CA. Yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate um, the information you shared and, um, Gosh, I'm I'm going to do some more research on my own and look into it myself because this, I mean, what else is, it's about the whole person. So I love it. Absolutely. And yes. I want to thank you for all the work that you've done. And oh no, it's uh, it's a lot of time and energy to be able to put these things on, but it's people like you that are are making the difference uh, and getting the message out there because it needs to be from the grassroots. It takes too much time for the, the powers that be to make any type of change. And so it's yeah. like people like you that that push these things along and, and get uh, this education out to, to individuals uh, and be able to kind of spread this message of, of health and well-being the way that should be understood. So thank you very much for all the work that you do. You're welcome. And I appreciate you saying that. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Glenn Alex show. We really hope you learned something about heart rate variability, and we'll talk to your primary healthcare provider to measure it and enhance your health. Refresh your spirit with a nourishing thought. Please allow me to leave you with this nourishing thought. According to Cleveland Clinic, your heart's variability reflects how adaptable your body can be. They also add that people with higher heart rate variability tend to have less stress and are happier. Conversely, low HRV indicates that your system, your body, is less resilient and struggles with change. We are dynamic creatures. We change regularly. So struggling with change is a factor in diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, anxiety, and depression, which, by the way, are the number one and number two mental health disorders among American adults. People with more time in between heartbeats tend to be less stressed and handle challenges better, hence the mind-body connection. Seems that HRV is a measure of the whole person, and HRV is considered a good indicator of physical as well as psychological health because both are impacted by stress. So please contact your primary health care provider to assess your HRV and to use it to enhance your health. And if you want more information on total health and the mind-body connection, please visit glenalex.com, order your copy of my three-time award-winning book, Living in Total Health, take advantage of the BOGA special, and book your complimentary consultation with me to enhance your health. Then tune into the next episode of the Glenn Alex Show, the 2023 Positive Change Podcast Award winner. And until next time, be well.